Hello, I'm Dennis Tucker. I want to welcome you to another study out in the barn, as I'm literally out inside the, in the barn, on uh, the place we live at. And so we hope you open your Bibles along with us. I wasn't, I didn't have a, a study last week as we had taken a week's vacation on uh, October 12th. We had a grandson born to us, uh, Theodore Jackson Lindsay was born, and so. We took a week's vacation to help out with uh, the other grandson, uh, Thomas Lindsay. And so he was with us. He's about two, two and a half years old. And, uh, and Regina and I both found out that a two-year-old has no mercy. They wear you out. And uh, but it was really good to be able to keep him, to watch him. And we are thrilled to death to have another grandson, another grandchild. Uh, but uh, that meant then that I didn't teach... Uh, the lesson on Hebrews, the fourth chapter, verses 11 through uh, verse 16, is what last week's lesson was on. Although when you look back at it, and I'm going to start here in Hebrews, fifth chapter, and we're going to go cover verses 1 through uh, 10 in this uh, lesson right here. But if you look in verse 1 of chapter 5, you'll find the word for. And that means because we have to go backwards here to see what he just got through saying. Because he's tying this in to the point, uh, or points he's making in chapter uh, 5. And so when I back up to chapter 4, verse uh, 14, it says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed through the heavens, Jesus, Son of God, let us lay it hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points, tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It's hard for us in some ways relate to the importance of the high priest in the Old Testament. And I came across this description of it, and I'll just read it to you. But it said, without a doubt, the earthly splendor of the Jewish high priest was a factor of seductive influence on Christians, especially those of Jewish background. His rich robes, the extravagantly ornate breastplate, the unique privilege of entering the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, his status as judge and president of the Sanhedrin, his dramatic influence as the official representative of the Jewish nation, more especially at a time when they had no king, the traditional descent of the officer and sons varying and reaching all the way back to the Exodus, and the grudge and respect paid to the office, even by the Roman conquerors. And that is, you may recall, that when it came to um, the death of Jesus, that there was a trial, basically, uh, that Jesus appeared before Caiaphas and Annas, uh, basically, as they were serving as high priests at that time, and that is, uh, Caiaphas was the one the Jews recognized, and Annas was, or Ananias was the one that the Romans were recognizing. And so they, they dealt with, the Roman government dealt with these high priests as officials of the Jewish nation. And so we thought, think about it. You had the temple, probably, again, this was written before the destruction of Jerusalem. And so, the, and this book is written to Jews, the people who had converted to Christianity, and now were in danger of going back into Judaism, where, where it actually because of persecution. And the trials they're facing were actually tend to go back into Judaism, I mean, if you stop thinking about it, they had this big elaborate temple there. And not only that, but also they had this high priest they could look at and see all the splendor of his office. And a good point made there, and that is when the Jews came back from captivity, they did not have a king. And so the one that became kind of the symbol of their nation, they became uh, the, the symbol of the relationship with God, was the high priest. And so he says in that sense there, because of those things, let us come boldly to the throne of grace, and that, that we have this relationship with God because of this covenant with him. And so we have access to God. And so let us come boldly to God. Not just let us come to God, but let us come boldly to God. And so he says there in verse 16. And so that gets into chapter 5. Now, chapter 5, the first question is, And what things does a priest from a man serve? Well, verse 1 says, For every high priest taken from among men is appointed of men in things pertaining to God. 
And so that's the idea. The revised standard says to act on behalf of men in relationship to God. And so the duty of the high priest was to actually to stand between God and man and to approach God on man's behalf. That was the position that the high priest had. You may recall earlier in our study of Hebrews, that talked about Jesus being the apostle and mediator, the, the one that would reveal God's will to mankind, but also would approach God on our behalf. And so the high priest here was one that approached God on the Jewish people's behalf. And so that's what, that was what his role was as far as to serve among men. And then also he says that, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins in verse 1. And when I got thinking about this, and of course, we understand if you go back and you read through the, the law of Moses, there's all kind of different sacrifices that, that people would bring to the, Jew, to the priest and they would offer to God. And the high priest in particular was one that went to the holy of holy places. But what stood out to me is this idea of both gifts and sacrifices. And the gifts basically said it are the unbloody sacrifices. And that is, there were things like grain offerings and meal offerings that they would offer to God. Those were the gifts to him. But then there were the animal sacrifices, the blood sacrifices. And so the priests offered both the grain offerings and the drink offerings and the peace offerings, but also the offerings for sin. And it's basically the high priest would offer uh, once a year, a sacrifice on behalf of the people and himself for the sins committed by the Jewish people. And so that's, that's what his job was there as far as his role uh, uh, between man and God. But then the next question is, uh, let me get my pages here. I'll straighten out. Uh, the, the next page here says, unto whom does the high priest have compassion? And, and what that refers to is verse 2, and again, talking about the high priest, says that he can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray. Now, earlier, when you read about the high priest, or we read about the Jesus becoming like us, it is necessary for him to do that so that he could be a sacrifice for our sins, and that he could be tempted as we are, and yet not sin, as we are reading about in this lesson here. And so the high priest, though, was one who actually made this atonement for sins. Now, there were sins of ignorance and that, that would, they would offer this atonement for. And basically, the function here was to educate the people as to the consequences of such sins. Sometimes today, people may downplay sin about, oh, what's the big deal about it? Well, Jesus knew that where sin there was an offering for sin there was the death of an animal there was something being offered on behalf of sins and so they realized that there was a connection between death and sin or between atonement and the sacrifice for sins and then we read about sin as presumption over in psalms 19 verse 13 david said keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins let them not have dominion over me then I should be blameless and I should be innocent of great transgression. Now that means that sometimes there were sins people committed out of ignorance. Uh, sometimes sins they, they weren't intending to sin, but they just kind of uh, did what they thought was right and it, was, it wasn't. And so that's what this priest offered these sacrifices for. But it goes on, it says, what enables the high priest to have such compassion? And, and the reason that the idea of compassion here is the idea of sympathizing with us, being able to relate to us. And what in Hebrews 5 verse 2 says, he can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also subject to weaknesses. And so he basically this high priest was a perfect person. And this high priest had to offer sins on his own behalf because he has sinned against God. And he was in a position of looking at the people and saying, how dare you sin against God or how bad it is you sin against God because he himself was a sinner. He himself needed sacrifice for his own sins. And so he could have compassion on those. He could relate to those who have sinned against God because he himself has sinned against God. Since he is also subject to weaknesses, as verse 2 says. For whom does he offer sacrifice? Well, again, in verse 3 says, because this he is required as for the people, 
and that is the audience, the, the Jewish nation, so also for himself to offer sins for a sacrifice for sins. And so if you go back and read through Leviticus 16th chapter, you'll find that one of the first things the priest had to do was had to offer the sacrifice for his own sins so that he could then approach God on behalf of the other people, of the people of Israel. And so when we read through this, we realize the Levitical priesthood was not perfect. Uh, the, the high priest, as he offered sacrifice for sins, was made aware of his sins as he would offer sacrifice for himself. And Leviticus 4 verse 3 says, If the appointed priest's sins bring guilt on the people, then let him offer to the Lord for a sin which he has sinned, a young bull without blemish as a sin offering. And so, you know, the first thing in order of business really was, I have sinned against God, I need to take care of my sins. And therefore, he gets sympathized with those who have likewise sinned, is the idea of Hebrews 5, verses 2 and 3. But then, who is the first high priest of the Israelites? So what we've seen here so far is the high priest approaching God uh, on our behalf, but the high priest himself was a sinner. He needed a sacrifice for his own sins, but because of that, he could relate to the people. Now, now this question is, who was the first high priest of the Israelites? In verse 4, it goes on and says, And no man takes his honor to himself, but he who is called by God just as Aaron was. So when we go back to the Old Testament, to the establishment of the law, we find that Aaron was the very first high priest in Exodus 28, verse 1. Now take Aaron, your brother. This is God talked to Moses. Now take Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the people of Israel, that he may minister me as priest. Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithmar. And so when you look at this, you realize Aaron did not take this position on self. It was in a case where Aaron said, you know what, I'll be the high priest. But God chose Aaron from among the people of Israel and chose his sons to serve as priests among the children of Israel. So it was in a case where Aaron ran for this office of high priest or that his sons ran for the office of priest. Instead, it was given to him by God. And no one could take that role of priest away from him except for God. As, as you go through the Old Testament, you find there's a number of times where uh, maybe uh, Miriam and uh, uh, somebody else had complained, uh, uh, Kohath, I think it is, but complained about the idea of Aaron uh, being a priest and thinking about, well, we're all children of God. We, you know, why is this limited just to Aaron and his priesthood and his family? Or you may think about King Saul as he offered a sacrifice to God. That was a role he never had, was never authorized to have. Or King Uzziah, as he goes to the temple to offer, uh, burn incense to God and struck leprosy. And the reason that was so bad is that they were not instructed by God to be priests. This was a role given to them, uh, to Aaron and his sons, by God. That's the point he's making here. And so the next question, who glorified Christ be high priest? Now, keep, keep in mind, we're talking to Jews who understood very well this royal priesthood, accepted very well the uh, Levitical priesthood. In fact, that Aaron was first high priest, and, and from that, all the other priests ascended. They didn't have to quarrel with that. And by the way, some are looking at it and saying, well, why is Jesus now the high priest? Well, verse 5 said, So also, in other words, just as Aaron was selected by God, so also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but was he who said to him, You are my son today, I have begotten you. Who said that? Well, God said that. God's the one that said those words here. If you go over to Hebrews 1 verse 5, back to the first chapter of Hebrews 1 verse 5 says, for to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you, and again I will be to him a father, and he should be a, to me a son. And all the way through those first number of verses there in Hebrews first chapter is pointing out who Jesus was. He is very radiant of God, the very image of God. He is the one that God speaks to us today. He is superior to the angels. He is superior to Moses. That He is the superior messenger. And then we see that he is the superior high priest. 
Because, first of all, God anointing him or appointing him to be the high priest. Next question. Christ is high priest after the order of who? Well, this interest, God, is just not according to the order of Aaron. Okay, that's not the, the priesthood of Christ according to that order. But in verse 6 here says, as he also says in another place, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, the Melchizedek is known, if you go back to Genesis, and we're reading about this priest of Salem, of Jerusalem, what Salem was, uh, it's another name for uh, Salem, is Jerusalem, that Melchizedek, all of a sudden we find, read about him being a priest, a king and priest both. And later on, over in Psalms 110, verse 3 and 4, and that's where this quote is coming from. Verse 3 says, Your people should be volunteers in a day of your power, and the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning you, you have the dew of your youth. Verse 4, The Lord has sworn and will not relent, ye are priests forever according to order of Melchizedek. And again, now think about this, and that is, that we already had the Aaron, the Levitical priesthood. But this time about a different priesthood in Psalms 110. He's, and, and so he doesn't refer back to the Aaron Nick priesthood. I believe it's the right way of saying that. But instead he goes back to Melchizedek. So this here again, again kind of brings about the point of, you now who was Melchizedek? And what ways can the high priesthood of Christ be compared to him? Because that really is a central part of this argument. And so when we go back to Genesis 14, verse 18, it said, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high. And now this is after Aaron had rescued Lot. Lot had lived near Sodom and Gomorrah, and there was a war that broke out between certain kings, and Lot wound up being taken hostage. And so Abraham goes and rescues Lot, and here he comes to Melchizedek, king of Salem. And so, and now we're going to pick this up again. Hebrews 7 goes more to Melchizedek. Now we're going to have Hebrews 6 almost kind of an interlude here. Uh, kind of like, oh, by the way, let's talk about this here a little bit. But we have no record of Melchizedek ever dying. Now, obviously, he did die. But as far as Scripture is concerned, as far as the record of his priesthood, and again, the contrast here, because, see, the, the Jews had a list of priests, and they could trace it all the way back to Aaron. They could go all the way to the modern day of the priest. But Melchizedek, all they have is this name, Melchizedek, and they had no other priesthood mentioned that would have taken his place. And he was a man also selected by God. If you go on down verse 10, it says, Called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So as Aaron was selected to be the high priest, so also Melchizedek was selected by God to be the high priest. And so that's what his order, and that's how he's compared him to Christ. And that Jesus is going to be a priest forever without any end to his priesthood until he comes back again. With what did Christ offer prayer supplications? Now again, we talked about this high priest being able to sympathize with us, with us because he was tempted to us all points with that without sin. Well, how does he sympathize with us? Well, he offered a prayer supplication. When we go to verse 7 of Hebrews 5, says, Who in the days of his flesh, talking about Christ, in the days he lived here on earth, we had offered up prayer supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of godly fear. Now, when did that happen? What event is, talk, is the Hebrew writer referring to? He referred to Jesus and the Garden of Gethsemane. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he goes and he separates himself from most of the disciples, but a couple he takes with him, and he then prays to God. And the prayer to God is, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. And he prays three times, and each time, uh, the answer is no. But we find here in... Luke 22, verse 44, it says, of being in agony, he prayed more earnestly than, his, uh, than his, his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And that here, agony means intense suffering. 
And so he, here he was, the garden of Gethsemane, praying and crying out and tears flowing from him to God. Now, again, the answer to that prayer was no. It was uh, God had, Now, Jesus acknowledged that thy will be done. And so he had to die on the cross for us. Well, that brings to the next question in. What did Christ learn? By what did Christ learn obedience? Well, verse 8, though, it says, Though he was son, you know, though he was the one that God said, You sit in my right hand, though he was the very radiance, the very image of God, the very uh, person of God, yet he learned obedience by things he suffered. And, and so that death on the cross, that he says he learned obedience. There's a difference between innocence and virtue. You know, innocence means life untested. Virtue, on the other hand, is innocence tested and triumphant. Jesus showed virtue. Jesus showed uh, obedience by his death on the cross. And, and when it says he learned obedience, that, that sometimes we have a kind of problem with the idea of learning something. Well, there's a difference between the mental knowledge of, of something and actually the personal experience. And Jesus, as deity, knew what suffering is all about. But as a person, as a man on earth, that when he died on the cross, he experienced that personally. And so in that sense, he learned obedience by things which he suffered. Now, again, I go back to the fact that he pray to God three times that possible let this cup pass from me but thy will be done and that if God has said okay don't die you know that we would not have sacrificed for our sins but when he had to when he realized he had to die on that cross when he submitted to the will of God he was showing obedience to God and sometimes in our lives uh, we may wish things to be different we may pray to God for something else to be different but we must always accept the will of God and be obedient to that will. Well, the next question is, and to whom did Christ become the author of eternal salvation? Now, again, we're talking about the superiority of the priesthood of Christ. And so, as a priest, he learned obedience. He offered himself. And so, in verse 9, it says, it had been perfected. And that word perfected means to be made complete. And that is fully qualified to be a, a priest. Sometimes, it does not refer to the fact that there may have been moral imperfections of Christ. But that he had to be the complete high priest. He had to come to offer sacrifice to God. And so he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Author there is, uh, some translations would say, the captain of our salvation. And the idea is that he is the very source of our salvation. We cannot be saved without Jesus. And so he is the author of our salvation in that passage. And then as we go on, and so what we find here is in our contrast, in our, in our looking at these verses, and they have Aaron's priesthood and position of, of importance. We should not downplay. And the one thing I keep on going back to when I study through Hebrews is that it, it does not build up Christ by diminishing the others. It is not built up, for instance, when we say that Jesus is superior to the prophets. That is not meant to downplay who the prophets were. They were spokesmen of God. Jesus is superior to the angels. Again, they are ministers of God. Let's not downplay their role. Uh, Moses was a lawgiver, servant of God. But that, and, you know, let's not downplay his position. Well, the priesthood, well, this priesthood was one of importance in the Jewish system. And they offer sacrifices and, and gifts to God. And they re represented God, were between God and man. And they were called of God. And so all those things are important. But Jesus Christ is at the order of Melchizedek, which is prayer because it is a priesthood that God had appointed. That Christ gave himself in verse 7 of our passage here. And it's going to be talked about later on that the other priests bring gifts to offer but jesus brought himself as the gift to offer to god that he is the author of our eternal salvation and he fulfills the prophecies and i talked about as far as the priesthood after the order of melchizedek and so those things are all important in talking about christ and being our high priest 
Well, it goes on, and we have kind of a thought question here, and that is Hebrews 5, verse 4, is often used to prove that preachers must be called of God. Do you think one must have a supernatural calling in order to preach? And it says, give reasons for your answer. And there are certain people that say, you know, when uh, they ask me, they say, well, uh, when did you get your calling? And what they mean is when I had a special feeling or maybe the light shone from above and all of a sudden I realized, well, then it's your post to go out and preach the word of God. And and so they, they, they get kind of us for that. But what we look at is that we make the decision whether to obey God or not. We make the decision whether to preach the word of God or not. And so you know, we have passages such as Second Peter 1 verse 10. Therefore, brethren, be more diligent to make your call and action sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. In other words, you be diligent to make your, your, the, to make your call and election sure. We decide for ourselves what we're going to do, if we're going to obey God or not. But then also I notice in Acts 13, verse 30, 39, that it says, Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins, and by him, everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. And the reason I quote that passage is because that those who believe is justified. Those who are willing to submit to the will of God are justified. And then verse 46 said that Barnabas, uh, Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary the word of God should be pre spoken to you first, but since you reject and judge yourself on the word of everlasting life, Behold, we turn to the Gentiles. And all three of these passages, what I'm trying to get across here is this idea that whether it's to preach the gospel or whether to obey the gospel, that there's not going to be some kind of strange light to shine on us or some kind of miraculous manifestation, but simply the fact of listening to and obeying the word of God. That's how we're called, is through the word of God. And anybody's preaching is because they read through the Bible and they want to spread that word of God. And so that's why we, how we uh, how we would answer that, that question. Well, so that gets us to the end of our study. And I do appreciate you watching. And I will simply mention that uh, we are meeting at the Lyle Road Church of Christ. So if you can, come be with us. Our building is located at 1687 Lyle Road, Litchfield, Kentucky. And on Sunday morning, we have Bible classes at 930 and worship at 1025. And then on Wednesday nights, we have Bible class at 7 p.m. If I can aid you in anything, if I can help you in any way, uh, let me know. I know there are some that are dealing with uh, the virus personally. Uh, the seems like the longer this goes on, the more people I know that have either had the virus or maybe uh, that have lost loved ones because of this, and that we have to keep in mind that we always need to be ready to face God. That each day we have is a special gift from God. Our lives are temporary, that we are very mortal, that we get sick, we get hurt, we die, and we need to use our time wisely in God's service. And so if I can aid you in doing that, if I can aid you physically, anything you need, just let me know, and I'll do whatever I can to help you. But I do appreciate you watching. If you like the program, hit the like button, and feel free to share this. And so until the next time, I hope you have a good day.